Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending today. Um, you are here for a live Q&A session about uh, website optimization best practices for community colleges. Um, and you are here with myself and my uh, co-host here, Jeff Meese. Um, so we'll just do some quick intros. Um, my name is Amy Kilpatrick. I am a product manager here at Mongoose. And before my time at Mongoose, I spent about 10 years um, with marketing agencies, uh, helping my clients build and design and optimize their websites, um, as well as other digital tools and digital ads and social media. So um, that is my background. I'll let Jeff introduce himself. Well, thanks, Amy. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome and um, happy post Labor Day. Uh, my name is Jeff Meese, and uh, I am a sales director here at Mongoose. Uh, prior to my time at Mongoose, I spent 25 years on you all's side of the desk. In fact, I worked uh, in the University of Wisconsin Colleges, or what was known, known as the University of Wisconsin Colleges way back when. So very familiar with the two-year uh, community college environment, uh, and really, really excited, excited to uh, talk with you guys about and see kind of what kind of questions you guys have. Great. Yeah, so this session is really for you. Um, Jeff and I are going to kind of tee it up a little bit, um, but mostly we want to hear your questions and your thoughts. So you can use the Q&A function right there in your Zoom taskbar. Um, no need to wait to send in your thoughts or questions. Go ahead and do it anytime, um, and we'll try to keep taking questions as we go. Um, but to start off, we'll just kind of set the stage a bit. So um, Jeff and I recently hosted a webinar for higher ed institutions of all types to talk to, about optimizing websites uh, for recruitment. Um, and really kind of the, the origin of this whole discussion is about how things have been changing in the world of web for quite some time, but accelerated even more so of late. Um, and it really centers around the expectations that people have about their website experiences today. Um, you know, we talk about digital natives and their attention span and how if you don't see someone within, I think it's eight seconds, uh, they are likely on to their next digital experience. And the different ways and channels that they communicate in these days have really kind of um, kind of forced everyone into a certain type and style of communication. Um, so that's kind of what we're up against, I think, uh, in the in the realm um, today. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think one of the pieces is, again, as we're kind of framing our discussion a bit today, uh, and a jump off, jumping off point of from where we what we had done with the earlier webinar is when we take a look specifically at our colleagues and our and our partners within the community college realm. What we're talking about is um, some struggling times for many of you, as as you all know. Maybe not everybody, but for for many many of you, where um, you take a look at what enrollments look like and enroll, enrollment declines that are happening, uh, especially after what happened over the last year and a half with COVID and how the challenges with students being uh, attending the institution and what those are going to be looking like. So you, when you take a look at how the frame of community of the community college or the two year college experience is right now, there's some real challenges you guys are dealing with. And, and part of what our goal is, is today is to really try to help give you some ideas, spark some interest. Maybe you see in the queue in some of the questions and answers uh, from other folks some new ideas uh, that will help you, hopefully help you when you take a look at your website and what it's gonna look like in the long run. And, and I think one of the biggest challenges that you take a look at with community colleges really does come down to the multitudes of audiences that you have to work with and support as they go through their college experience. Very different than a traditional um, liberal arts uh, four-year institution kind of environment because not only are you dealing with and working with um, traditional age students that are coming right out of high school. You're also working with dual enrollment students that are still in high school for looking for college credit. You're looking for returning adult students um, who may be coming back for certification, looking to enhance uh, the kind of education that they've gotten if they've been away from it for a while, what that those nerves look like and supporting them in that engagement. Um, you're doing things face to face, but you're also doing a lot of stuff online. 
right? So how do you how do you balance that kind of scenario? And then also you've got a big population of students that are going to start with you, and their whole goal is to transfer on to end up getting a four year degree. Or maybe if you've got certain situations on your campus uh, at the two year institution where you can offer them to stay at the two year institution and complete their degree there as well. So as you can tell, just a variety of different audiences. You all know this because you work with them and support them all the way through that process. Uh, and that's really what we want to talk about a lot today is how to help and serve those folks. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, unique to, to this audience is you have all of those different types of people that you're communicating with, and you want to engage with all of them <laughs> at scale um, with, you know, limited staff resources. So that seems like a math problem with no solution. Um, but that's what we're here to, to talk about a bit today and see, you know, what, what type of gaps technology can fill um, to allow you to, to talk with all those audiences um, in the way that you want to uh, most efficiently. Um, and I think the, the kind of elephant in the room here, and we, we talk about, um, you know, the latest um, Ruffalo and Noel Levitt's the expectations report that came out um, and it, is probably not a surprise to anyone that the web suit website is the most single most influential resource for your students, regardless of where they are at in the process, but especially in the enrollment process. Um, and uh, I think the stat is one in four students will leave the website if they're frustrated. So there's a lot at stake here with kind of getting the, the website experience right. So, um, you know, just talking a little bit more about um, lack of staff resources and you know needing kind of additional help um, to, to overcome these challenges. Um, you know there's a lot to do. there's a lot of audiences to communicate with. there might not be a lot of bodies and seats um, there in your respective departments. Um, a website redesign is probably not in the budget for a lot of folks. Um, so they need solutions that can be implemented quickly. Um, within their current infrastructure, um, you know, and, and not every institution is going to have a, a webmaster or a web team. Um, so I'm hoping that today we can really talk about some things that um, are not difficult to, to figure out or difficult to accomplish, but can, can hopefully make a, make a big difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, when you talk about these different audiences and, and how to support them, again, depending on what kind of short staffing you have available on your website. Um, the other piece that we we noticed when, when we got the feedback from the e-expectations report this year um, was identifying and, and finding the particular pieces of information that um, site visitors, so students, family members, that type of stuff are looking for on your website you need to make certain aspects and certain pieces of information very, very easy for them to find. And as you all know, um, when we talk about most college websites nowadays, the great reality is you've got so much information because the website's there to support the entire institution. So if you've got prospective students that are looking for information, if you're looking for current, having current students look at in, looking for information for support services, for example, on campus, you know, you have so much data that's out there and available, you need to find ways to get them that information very quick, very easily as they go through that process. So things to think about when you are trying to outline what information needs to be most accessible to them uh, as they're searching for information. One piece is gonna be, um, as you might imagine, cost. Never, 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 and I know most folks get this, but there's still, I, I know a lot of uh, institutions out there that make their, uh, or have it hard for people to find how much it costs to, to attend their institution. That is one of the top if not the top uh, item that most folks are looking for as far as being able to understand how to be able to afford the institution, um, not only from the cost itself, but what kind of scholarships do you have? What kind of other services, grants, opportunities do you have available? So costs are gonna be a big key piece of it. Um, when you think about programs, okay, why are students typically gonna be searching for information about you in, in the first place? It's gonna be because they're looking for particular programs you're gonna have available to you. As you know, uh, within the community college or the two-year college uh, world, most of your population is gonna be a local population. So they're familiar with you as an institution. The information they may not be familiar with are the particular programs that you're gonna offer and what kinds of uh, ways to get through those programs. So it's gonna be a, a short hybrid kind of environment. Is it gonna be a traditional 16 week course? Whatever that process might be. 
As you also think about other pieces of information they're typically going to be looking for, it might be things like support services. You've got a lot of uh, returning veterans that are uh, that are attending your institutions. How can they find the kind of services that they need and, and the financial support that they need uh, as they're going through uh, your process as well? So again, just a couple of items to start thinking about when you talk about how to really uh, make information easy to find on your site. So we are starting to get some questions roll in. So um, I think we might as well just jump right into them. So um, we have a question here about um, how to best facilitate um, form completion um, and specifically the request info form. So yeah, definitely a challenge for many. Um, and you know, something that was addressed in the in the e expectations report as well is you know folks just really don't have the patience to fill out forms these days um, and they're not used to filling forms out um, through a lot of their various digital experiences so you know even though I'm sure many of us are are constantly kind of evaluating forms and figuring out how to make them shorter and easier to use um, the fact of the matter is there's just going to be a certain folks who are not going to be willing to fill out um, those RFI forms. And we have to, as difficult it is, as it is, kind of accept that um, and start to think about um, other ways that we can collect uh, the information that we need from them. So one of the things that was mentioned in, in the expectations report is um, utilizing chatbots for collecting form type of information and how much more comfortable students these days are with engaging with a chatbot um, in place of a request for information form. Um, so that is definitely something to think about and explore. The same types of things that you might ask on a form can be asked kind of through the course of a kind of natural feeling um, chatbot uh, conversation. And that's, that's really comfortable for students these days. Uh, it's absolutely true. And I, I, I also think, think it's important to realize that if you're exploring a chatbot option, which I agree with Amy, it's, it's just a huge asset that if you think 10, 15 years ago, we just didn't have that even available to us. Um, and now that it is, how can we use that as a resource to really help people complete their information. They stop becoming um, the secret visitors on your website, right? Stealth visitors to your website. And now they start to engage and you be can begin to collect this information on them. Not just the standard, here's the five pieces, six pieces of information that a traditional RFI would do, but actually getting a little deeper in that and getting key pieces of information so you can do follow-up. But I would also say, we're not suggesting that you get rid of your RFI if you get a uh, chatbot. It's a balance of being, of being able to use both of them so that you can, again, meet your audience where they are. And when you think about this, and Amy and I will probably bring this up multiple times during our discussion, um, is the reality that this digital group that um, you're engaging with now, these are the folks that have grown up with Netflix. These are the folks that are growing up and living in a world of Amazon. This is absolutely about the experience when they go to a website and being able to do that engagement the way they want to engage. So um, that's again where this, where that uh, concept or idea of a chatbot can tie into that as well. Yeah, and what we're getting a couple of other questions coming in that I that I think are is related to what you just mentioned there, Jeff, which is really choice. Um, so you know, yes, you still have your RFI form. Perhaps you have a chatbot as well that can be used to collect that type of information that you need about visitors. Um, we have some other questions coming in about a chatbot versus a, a call now, um, you know, CTA, um, and also about using Facebook, Facebook and Instagram as an extension of your website. Um, I, I think that the answer is all of the above because um, what folks are used to these days in their digital experiences is choice. So yep, I can call an email if I'd like. I can talk with this chat bot right now. Um, I can fill out this form and have somebody get in touch with me later. Um, you know, it really is kind of dependent on uh, the way that that individual wants to engage at that moment. Um, and it may change. And, you know, we see a lot of, of you know, uh, 
people in the digital space these days that would just prefer not to talk to someone right now. Um, they don't want to pick up the phone. Um, they don't want to wait for someone to email them. They just want to see if they can get their question answered. Maybe they want to raise their hand to have someone talk to them later, um, but they really are used to that choice. So I think as many choices as you can reasonably give them, um, the, the better chance you're going to get of engaging with them at that moment the way they want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, and I want to go back real quick. I, there's a couple of points in these questions, and these are fantastic questions. Keep them coming. Uh, Brian uh, had asked a question about, you know, the differentiation in your audiences between a traditional student and a returning adult audit student and, and how that needs to look on your website. The reason I want to bring this particular one up, Brian, is because of the fact, again, with something like a chat bot, you can have whatever audience that you want who's going to come and visit and they and to your point there's you just gave example of two very familiar ones that are going to come on a regular basis with the chat bot it gives you the opportunity to specifically in your first engagement with the bot and the site visitor ask the type of student they are based on that response now all of a sudden you begin to feed information to that specific audience based on who they are and what they're looking for. So again, when you know it's an adult audit student coming in, they're gonna get a different set of um, engagements with the bot than that traditional student would. And it's all based on your desire as an institution and how you wanna set that engagement up. The other thing we really like about bots is the fact that when you set those parameters up initially, you can always go back and actually go back and take a look at the statistics and the analytics. And we refer to it as optimizing the bot. But the reality is, is you can actually see how people are responding to the bot and make changes and adjustments to improve that engagement. Uh, and that's one of the most just fascinating pieces of this new technology or newer technology is that you can get so much data that you could never get before uh, when it comes to people visiting your website. That's one point. One piece I wanted to come back to on Jamie's point regarding the Facebook and the Instagram engagement. Um, one of the things that e, e expectations really honed in on was that students want video. And I keep saying video, video, video. And when you have good video or actually any video for that, for that matter, uh, and you have it on multiple platforms, whether it's gonna be social media, whether it's gonna be your website, you can use it and reuse it. That's the great thing about video. Um, the other thing we would encourage you to think about when you take a look at your video and depending on what, what video library you may already have on campus versus what you need to build out, authenticity is one of the key pieces that we heard from the e expectations report as well. And students saying, I wanna hear authentically what your institution is like and what that engagement is gonna be like, okay? Uh, I think a lot of people think about that, oh, that traditional private liberal arts experience, it goes way beyond that. It is, it is part of the community college experience as well because they're gonna be spending time with you. So I encourage you to think about how do you engage your current students in your video? And do you have them help you in that process? Because they are a great tool. And you hear about things like student takeovers and that type of stuff where they can really get some great authentic video uh, for your prospective students to take a look at. Yeah, and something I love too about Brian's question is I think um, he's really honing in on, on this idea of personalization here. Um, you, you do have so many different types of students that are looking for information on your website. You cannot give them a one size fits all experience. And again, thinking about what they're used to in Netflix and Amazon and these other sites that really give them curated content is they want to be able to easily find the answers that are right for them, um, and that's a challenge on a website. Um, you know, it's a, it's a navigation challenge. It's uh, a challenge identifying folks and getting them to the right place um, all on one page, as he says. So, so yeah, it is, it is definitely um, uh, difficult to do that. It is true, it is true. I know one of the questions that we typically get um, from folks when they ask about, you know, because we brought up chatbots and, and how that's going to play out. And I know a lot of our discussion may, may come around that is the cost and what is that return on investment framework and how do we, how, how do we as institutions invest in technology like this that's really going to do things, as Amy mentioned earlier, is save time save staff time, save staff resources, those types of things. And what I'm gonna suggest for folks, and again, I'm putting on my old enrollment management cap on uh, as a community college enrollment manager, 
is these are never easy decisions. And typically you're not going to be able to get some brand new budget um, that's going to be available to you. Sometimes you will, but in most cases, you don't just get a brand new budget. So the real hard strategic piece to this is to really take a look at, based on data, the expectations, other kinds of reports that are out there, and take a look at what these students are doing. And so again, when students are telling you that they are actually coming to the website as, as the number one way they're getting information for you, you really need to think about things like, what are you spending on, on paper? And what are you spending on mailings and those types of things? Um, and could you be taking the budgets, which we've traditionally been in the past, it used to work, traditionally spent doing that kind of recruitment and shift that into an investment of, uh, of what a bot technology would do for you. Why? Because you're still going to get the students engaged there. But again, as we're talking about, you're going to meet them where they are versus actually trying to fit, have them fit into our unique niche within higher education. So uh, I think one of the toughest pieces of it is, is to really look at the strategy and take a look at, uh, take a look at the decisions that you're, that you're going to do with your budget based on what students are telling us already. Yeah, and I think when we think about limited budgets and, and you know, we all have them and it's, it's not getting better. Um, so think about how to limit the, the staff time involved. So we're talking about automation, right? How can you help your various website visitors, various students and audiences self-serve, um, find the answers that they need um, without having to pick up the phone or talk to someone. And here we are, you know, back at websites. Websites are a really powerful tool, um, but many times it, it can be difficult for a visitor to navigate around and find what they're looking for. So how can we help them? Um, and, and again, anything that you employ, you're also thinking about the staff time that it takes to get that up and running. And how can you accelerate that by, you know, getting some help or, you know, finding something that's really kind of uh, quick to get up and running. No, it's true. And, and David, thank you for the question. The, the uh, other point that David makes too here is, again, we've been talking about multiple audiences to your website and how do you create an environment on your website um, to meet each of those audiences needs. Um, we use chatbot as the example, probably one of the um, best up and coming ways to do it. Uh, but if you're really looking at doing some redesign uh, of your website in order to best meet the needs uh, of those visitors, one thing I'm going to encourage you to think about is who is your primary audience or target audience? We talked about multiple different audiences today, but who is your primary target audience as far as the website is concerned? Um, and how is your website built around that audience? Let me give you an example. If I take what we talked about, the audit students, the prospective students, traditional age students, the returning adults, that type of thing, and I put them in a frame of prospective students. So I tie them all together as a prospective student group. That is what I would suggest that you really talk about on campus with leadership. That's the really target audience that you need to be going after. Yes, I know you've got alumni that are that are that you want to engage them as well. I know we also talked about perspective or current students and how we engage them, but your primary audience when you think about enrollment in many ways is really going to be those prospective student groups. So how does your website look and what kind of support do you have within that website to really focus on the needs of those prospective students? And this again goes back to David's question. When you look at things like school counselors, they are a tool for you to help recruit those students. To campus and to keep them on campus through retention. So um, really focusing on that perspective group when you talk about your, uh, your design on, you know, of your website. Yeah. Yeah. So David asks about creating designated, you know, web sites um, for different types of visitors. Um, I don't know that you necessarily need to have a, a separate website or domain. Um, but certainly a, a dedicated web page for certain audiences. Um, would be great if you have the flexibility and the time to, to kind of put those into place, just kind of collect everything that is most important to, to that particular audience and make it really easy for them to locate things. But um, unfortunately, we see that even when a dedicated experience or section or page is, 
is made for audiences. Sometimes they're just not willing to scroll. They're not willing to read. Um, they want a, a quick answer um, and they're used to a quick answer. So, um, you know, we have to deal with that reality as well. Um, and sometimes they just, they want to chat with someone, they want to talk to somebody. Um, so we have to make that option available to them too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we just got another uh, question from an anonymous attendee, a uh, really good one that we, we talked quite a bit about having to do with what do we do with confidential information when it comes to bot collecting of information. And I think one of the things that is so unique and, and really valuable about uh, bots right now is that again, humans are the ones that are really building out the core, the brain, if you will, of a bot. And so when you talk about that and when you talk about that engagement the bot's gonna have with your site visitors, you as the institution can really create a situation where you can avoid collect, collecting information, certain pieces of information like social security number, that type of stuff. And instead, when you're looking at being able to um, get request traditional requests for information things like first name last name uh maybe an email address a cell phone number those are really really valuable tools for all those follow-ups without having to go into depth when you take a look at um confidential information like social security numbers that type of thing um, we can get deeper into and amy may may touch a little bit more on this we have you have bots out there that can do so much in so many things for you as an institution for example, you can have a bot actually uh, go out there and, and uh, handle your entire transcript request process if you wanted to do that. And again, that's where you get into that question about confidentiality and that kind of de detail of information. But there are definitely ways that you can authenticate, two-way authentication, that type of stuff to make sure you've got the individual who's actually requesting that particular information. But um, Amy, I know you've got a lot of information and a lot of, uh, of samples on on this confidential question. Yeah, no, I think you you really hit it um, at the nail on the head there is, you know, you as an institution really have control over what you collect and what you ask for. Um, and even with some bot technologies, you know, you have control over when, when folks have the ability to type and when you just want to kind of guide them through an experience to limit the maybe sometimes people are a little bit too eager to volunteer <laughs> personal information information so um so yeah you you have control over that um experience and um and a lot of flexibility and and really when it gets to some of those kind of trickier um you know tasks that that people want to complete that might require a credit card um, that's when the power of really integrating a bot with an existing system that already has those security um, features in place, you know, um, really can help out so you don't have that information living in your bot experience. The other thing that um, that is out there that you really do need to think about, and, and again, this is, I want to tap into Amy's greater depth of expertise in this than mine, has to do with, um, we're talking about the site, your website itself, and, and we do know how important it is for your website to be so functional and, and um, usable by all the different um, audiences that come in. But how are those audiences actually getting to your site? Okay, that's another piece. And we talked about this in our last uh, webinar as well. But are you efficiently and effectively getting people to your website when they go out there and do their searches? Um, so Amy, you want to touch a little bit on that as well? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there really is kind of a, a wide variety of um, you know, depths that folks are into online advertising and digital advertising and, and the various ways that um, you are driving people um, to your website. But um, the, the RNL report really gave us kind of some even more um, emphasis on a few different sources that we should zero in on. Uh, and one of them is search. Um, so many folks, and I can't remember the exact stat here, but um, are coming to uh, an institution's website via a Google or other uh, type of search engine. Um, so that tells us that we need to pay some special attention to search engine optimization on our websites. And, and that really means kind of zero in, zeroing in on um, what words people are using to, to drive to your website, where are they landing, um, getting those words and phrases into your content 
and making sure that you're keeping your content fresh so that the search engines uh, recognize that and, and get people there. And I think to Jeff's earlier point, they might not be landing on the pages that you anticipate they're landing on. Um, they might not be starting at the home page. They might be starting on some, you know, deeper program pages that you're not quite prepared for them to be on. Um, and so, so keep that in mind too, and make it easy um, for them to to navigate around. Um, and you know, thinking about how how much people like to use search engines, they're also really interested in using site search once they get to your website. So navigation is great and you want to make it easy for, for folks to find what they're looking for. But if you have a site search on your website, uh, that is worth some attention and investment as well, um, helping to, uh, to get people exactly where they're looking for and using those same keywords and terms um, to, to get them around the site via a search. So um, digital ads are great. Retargeting is really powerful. If you know that folks have been on your website or perhaps they're prospective students, but they didn't quite convert, they didn't fill out that form, um, they didn't get to the application. Uh, if you can retarget them and get them back to your site, then, then that is a really powerful means. Absolutely. And boy, and David, great question, because uh, this taps right into what Amy's talking about, which is um, kind of the old way of thinking where you're where you're shooting folks, uh, retargeting them to, to a particular landing page. Not that you still wouldn't want to do that. But again, when you think about, uh, again, bot technology, um, that engagement with uh, with the site visitor is on their terms, not yours. And so uh, you'll still get the information you need with that correct bot setup, but the reality is going to end up being you're not going to force them into a particular page and then and lose them, as you mentioned in your kind of in your question there. So, um, so, so I think that that rethinking the way if you've got the tool like a bot, rethinking the way that you would do that landing page example um, is a good thing to do. It's a really good thing to do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't think that that experience uh, really works for folks these days. <laughs> um, I think you're you're much more likely to lose them by kind of forcing them into a path that you want them to take. Um, so sure, keep them focused. Um, make the CTAs that are are most critical at that point, um, not just for you but also for them. Make them easy to find at front and center, but also give them give them a way out. Um, so that they can kind of guide their own experience. And, you know, we talk about, we talk about give and take. There is information that we want as higher ed professionals from our website visitors and our prospective students. And we hope that they just give it to us, right? Just fill out the form, just tell us who you are. Um, but we have to remember that they want something back from us too. So provide good value, provide them choice, provide them options, and they're going to be much more likely to give the information that you want from them. It's very true. And and this is all, there's another piece to this that, that I want to throw in uh, for you all to think about, which is uh, asking yourself, is your website mobile friendly? Okay. Now, many of you, they have to, of course, Jeff, it's mobile friendly. Go out, try it, see what the experience looks like. It's amazing what you'll find out when you actually take yourself through that on your cell phone or whatever it may be. If your site isn't mobile friendly, you're losing people. You are absolutely losing people because the full expectation is that they're going to be able to engage with you visually, um, questions, whether it's through a bot, whatever it may be, but it's got to be mobile friendly and it's got to be responsive. Um, so make that a priority as well when you think about how you're redesigning or framing uh, your website. Is that mobile friendly aspect to it? Yeah. Yes. I think the stat from the e-expectations report was 92% of students are using mobile for some or all of their web browsing. So the days of a great, beautiful desktop website are over. <laughs> um, mobile is king um, now and forever. But um, but yeah, so so I, I like that idea, Jeff. Go out and test it yourself. See what it's like. Can, can you click those buttons that you so want people to click? Um, and, you know, we talked about um, 
simplifying content and simplifying navigation. Uh, there is no better way to check how simple your content is than by trying to look at it on a tiny screen. Um, keep people focused on what you really want them to know. Um, and, and really, you know, you hear the term mobile first, which basically means the, the experience that you would want for someone on mobile in terms of keeping them focused and keeping content slim is the experience that they want everywhere when they're on their laptop, when they're on their desktop. It's just the way people prefer to absorb content today. Absolutely, absolutely right. Um, one of the other questions that we've gotten um, before really has to do with the multiple functionality that's out there and available uh, when it comes to chatbots. And I use that term in quotes on, on purpose. Um, many of you may be familiar with the fact that, oh, there's an opportunity to get a chatbot or I can work with someone who, who can provide a chatbot for me. Uh, the reality is where we've gotten to at this point right now is, is the fact that chatbot is a piece that you, of course, can get separately. And then there's something called live chat where you bring a human being into the conversation doing live chat back and forth. You're doing this through your website. Um, and typically those things have been separated, right? Now you actually can find uh, opportunities to be able to bring that tool together. And why is that so important? It's so important because of the fact that um, you're going to want to start your engagements typically with a site visitor through a bot, but there is going to be a time when they're going to want to talk to a human and they don't just want to end and have to leave the website and that type of stuff. They want to actually take that chat that they've had with the bot and move it into the human conversation so that A, the human, the staff member on your, on your team can see what happened with the chat, but all, and then be able to pick it up and have that one-to-one uh, -one conversation. The other tool to think about um, having is, as far as at your disposal with things with these kinds of chatbots has to do with calendaring function. Why is that important? It really is important because of the fact if you think about your site visitors, they're going to come to your website 24 seven and from all over the place. Again, with the community colleges, it's primarily gonna be local, but if you just think about the engagement with a website, it could be from all over the world, whatever it may be. And they're gonna come at different times when your staff's not available. So to be able to engage with that bot, potentially get the answers that they need, but then if they're not able to, to be able to actually take that next step of, if I'm not gonna to talk to a human, I'd like to schedule an appointment to do a follow-up so that human can get back to me, okay? Again, not leaving that site visitor hanging at any point in time, always being able to serve their needs when they need them. So chatbot, chatbot technology has really expanded to include so many different assets that can really make your team so effective and save them so much time when it comes to being able to really serve students to the best they can. Yeah, and I think when I hear you kind of describe some of those things, Jeff, I, I think about the the balance that that all of us as higher ed professionals are walking between mm -hmm. um, automating and being smart with our limited resources, especially as it relates to staff time and encouraging self-service. But at the same time, we, we really want to help our students through their journey and be there for them when they need a little bit of extra assistance. And, you know, we, we talk about all the different types of students that, that are um, in the community college space and all of the different journeys that they have been on. And it's really important for them to be able to raise their hand wherever they are um, in our ecosystem <laughs> as an institution and wherever they are in their journey um, and whatever time of the day it is, um, it's really important for them to be able to raise their hand and say, I could use some extra help. Can you get me connected now? Um, so I think that's one thing that's really powerful about, about a, a web chat as well is um, the bot can help them out. They can raise their hand for help from live chat or um, book a meeting with someone um, so that we don't lose them and, and lose the opportunity to help them. No, it's true. It's true. And I think for me, and, and I want to go back to a point we were talking a little bit uh, earlier about having to do with the statistics and analytics that a bot can provide to you that just were not available in the past. Um, it is absolutely critical in, we talked budgets earlier, it is absolutely critical for institutions to think strategically about how they're spending their limited dollars very wisely. Again, not something new for this audience. Um, but when you talk about what a bot is collecting and the information that they're collecting on your site visitors, um, it is absolutely fascinating 
to see what's out there. And when you take a look on a fairly regular basis on what the bot and what the engagements with the bots look like, you have an opportunity to not only collect data, and again, things like prospective students, like an RFI, you're collecting so much information that then you can do follow-ups with, but you're also collecting data on how your site is performing. Okay, so I talk about the bot performing one way, but we also want to think about this, how the site itself is performing. And many of you out there stereotypically have been saying, okay, we just need to redesign our website. You may, you absolutely may need to redesign your website, but what are you using? What analytics are you using to make the decisions of how you're going to redesign that website? That's the kind of technology that bots provide now uh, and, and why institutions really need to seriously look at a tool like this when they are building out their sites or when they are taking a, something like a bot and adding it to their site. Um, not only are you seeing how it's performing and how to improve that engagement with folks, but also it's going to tell you how your, how your website might need to look in the future. Um, and again, it's ever evolving. So as that bot continues to collect information, you are able then to make uh, additional kinds of decisions on what direction you need to go with that site. Yeah, I do like that uh, idea of a, of a chat bot as another data source to help you with your decision making um, and not just decision making about the website, but about all of your content as a whole. Some other sources that I think are, are really valuable, uh, one very much related to your, well, both very much related to your website, um, Google Analytics. If you are using um, Google Analytics, I think there's some great information there as you think about how you might improve your website experience. Um, we talked a lot about RFI forms. Look at your form abandonment rate. <laughs> how many people are getting there and not filling it out? And, and what clues does that give you about some changes that you might want to make um, to that form or beyond? Um, you know, look at how long people are spending on your site and how many pages they're navigating to. Do they seem to find what they're looking for or do they seem like they are lost? Um, and, and that may give you some clues to some work that you can be doing, uh, as well as where do they leave your site? Perhaps those pages are pages that need a little bit more attention as you think about optimizing your website because something is perhaps frustrating there on that page that is making people drop off or perhaps they're finding their answer on that page could be one or the other, but um, I think your gut will tell you. Uh, what that is. So Google Analytics, great resource for you as you think about website optimization. Um, also your site search data. We talked about the, the value of a good site search and the data that comes of it is another uh, wonderful value. So look at what people are searching for and what are they having trouble finding? What gaps exist that are causing people to go up to that search bar? Um, you can use that along with, you know, phone call data and email, uh, frequently asked questions that you're getting via email, it's going to all give you kind of a picture of how your website needs to perhaps better serve um, your various audiences. Absolutely, absolutely. I just want to take a second um, as we are um, in our back end of our conversation today, um, see if there are some other questions that folks in the audience have um, that they'd like to throw out there for us as well. I was thinking, uh, Jeff, we might also spend a little bit more time talking about video. I know we tend to get a lot of questions about that, and you touched on that a bit, but I think there might be some more um, kind of interesting things that folks can do with video if they're not yeah. already. Absolutely. Well, again, the big the big question is is are you are are you already using some level of video uh, mm -hmm. in your communications with with students, um, both prospective students, current students, whatever it may be. I think we're probably most familiar with it from a prospective student environment where you're trying to show video of the institution, maybe campus tours, those types of pieces of information, uh, which are still great. And it's still exactly what your, what your students need to be able to see to get, to get a sense of what the institution is like. Um, I mentioned earlier about engaging your current students in your video and production of your video and letting them take over in, case, in some cases uh, some of the information for periods of time so that they can give again an authentic view of what it's like to be a college student at your institution. But a next level that I, we're starting to see with this population of students, especially traditional age students, but I think it really can work across the board with returning adults and those types of folks is 
taking processes and tasks that you typically have in written format and actually creating them in video content. For example, your application process. We don't think our application process typically are that, that hard or that challenging, but a new student, especially a first generation to college student that really doesn't have a lot of guidance in the college process, very much could be challenged by it. They very much wanna see and have grown up wanting to see things in video. So take them through the filing and the filling out of your uh, form uh, with application again, scholarship processes, way we may take them through it in a video process. Okay, it's great content to be able to have long term. You're not going to have to rebuild it all the time, uh, and it's a great tool if you don't already have a YouTube page out there. It is actually one of the great assets that you could start putting out there if you're just going to create a, a new uh, YouTube site. Put that kind of information that's out there. Pretty typically. Students can go out on YouTube right now and go find out how to fill out a FAFSA. Great. You may want to personalize that a little bit more from your financial aid team's perspective. How can we make that process a little easier for them to understand as they go through that, um, through, through those steps? So again, think about typical processes that you're going to normally go through um, in written format. How could you transition in those into video to make it a little easier for your audience to digest? Yeah. And I think when we talk about video and new content ideas for video, I think it can be overwhelming for a lot of people because they're kind of used to the days when creating a video meant production and lighting and sure, you need to pay attention to some of those things, but the expectations for video have changed as well. And I think it's really kind of to our benefit. Um, they don't expect <laughs> highly produced videos. In fact, they would prefer um, really kind of um, authentic videos, if you want to call it that, uh, low budget. <laughs> um, so, so don't hesitate to use video and don't be shy about using video and think about using it in ways that um, that you might not normally, but it really is a way that people like to absorb content today. So when you go to, you know, write a paragraph of content for your website, think to yourself, could I do this in a video instead? I would probably get more engagement as long as it's short um, and bite size. Uh, people really do love short little informational videos. Yeah. And again, don't forget, we mentioned this a little earlier, but I want to come back to it. Um, by creating those short snippets of video or the opportunity to make short snippets out of a video uh, that Amy talked about, that now also gives you content for your social, other social media besides YouTube. So if you wanna put information out there through Instagram at some level, not necessarily how to fill out an application, but again, things like um, the student takeovers, those types of things, um, that is a great way to engage um, somewhat minimal video content and have it in so many different places. So whether it's YouTube, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook, those types of places. Um, I think something that we all need to pay attention to in the coming uh, years is gonna be what TikTok is gonna look like within the higher education space. Um, it's still new and uh, there's not a lot of institutions that are really out there on that TikTok frame, if you will, but I think that's gonna continue to increase uh, as we've seen with Instagram and those types of social media opportunities. So give yourself an opportunity to be present with those students through your video um, and get in front of them. I mean, again, they're, that's, what, that's what they're looking for and that's what they wanna see from you. Yeah, and so when we think about video and, and utilizing it more on your website, we do need to pay attention to the mobile friendliness uh, factor of your video. So make sure you're using something like YouTube or, or Wistia or Vimeo so that your videos are optimized for mobile and kind of fit nicely within that ecosystem. But beyond that, go crazy, get creative, um, and uh, I think you'll, you'll get some good response to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, wanted to throw out to the crowd again, if there's any other kind of questions um, that you guys have, something we didn't talk about today with the website that you were interested in. Amy, did we miss anything? I don't think we did. No, oh, I, I think we had some great, you know, conversation about, um, you know, 
how to invest in a website with a limited budget and um, and how to prioritize staff time. Um, you know, we've we've kind of gotten questions in the past about um, how do I convince um, you know leadership at my institution to spend a little bit more time and money um, on the website. I'm not sure if we've talked about that um, at all, but you know, something that I I tend to think about as it relates to to higher ed institutions websites is, is just the amount of time and energy that um, is spent driving people to those websites. And we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about different advertising and marketing, but think about all the different places that your URL is listed um, out there in the universe. And, and if you're not focusing on making improvements to your website and optimizing that experience, um, you're putting all of that at risk. So, you know, it, it might seem like an afterthought for, for some folks, um, but, but think about everything that is going into driving people to that website um, and what an opportunity that is uh, to, to capture them and convert them and engage them. So um, just maybe kind of a different way to frame it as you're, as you're thinking about spending a little bit more in terms of investment in a website. And, and one other couple or a couple other pieces to leave everybody with, because again, typically kind of takeaways from this um, and what the future might look like. Um, I mentioned a moment ago just about what uh, a particular piece of social media, TikTok, I think that's going to become something in the future that's going to continue to build out. Um, hands down, as the core of this discussion, uh, your website is going to become even more critical and even more important. Uh, again, mobile friendly being a piece to that, but actually making it very, very easy for people to get through and, and get information on your site when they need it. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, this statistic, but literally you're going to have about four to six seconds um, on your website when somebody jumps on looking for information. And if you're not getting them what they need in that time frame, they're going somewhere else. Um, so it is becoming very critical because again, if you think of the very crass way to think of it, but the reality, every body is a um, is an investment, right? So every prospective student that you never even get to see is a dollar you never get to see either. So those are aspects that you really need to talk about as you're as you're strategizing as a, as a leadership team or on your institution is what is it you're losing if this if your site isn't performing at its top level again whether it's how to get there through Google or through um, search engine engine optimization or whether it's uh, bot technology and what's available there those are really the big tools to think about uh, for the for the near and distant future. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I love most about the digital space and working in the digital space is, um, you know, meeting the goals of your institution uh, and serving your um, audiences and meeting their needs are one and the same. <laughs> so <laughs> by focusing on your digital visitors, um, your audiences and making sure that they're getting what you need they need you are also serving the needs of your institution so it just makes it real nice and tidy um, and gives everyone kind of a place to focus well thank you everyone um, thanks for your time today thanks for your great questions um, we will be sending some follow-up information out to everyone who registered for this event, so keep an eye out for that. Um, come visit us at um, mongooseresearch.com, and Jeff and I are also on LinkedIn and would love to hear from you, um, so please don't hesitate to connect with us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.